hello and welcome to the Motivational Millennial Podcast. I am Blake Brandis. And I'm Ivy LeClaire. Today we are sharing some reflections from our conversation last week with Mark Guberti, who is a brilliant content marketer and host of the Breakthrough Success Podcast. And one of the questions that we asked Mark was what he had learned from all of these amazing guests who are successful creatives and entrepreneurs and all kinds of amazing people who he's had on his podcast. What has he learned from the guests? And he said the biggest takeaway for him was that they all put systems in place to help them leverage their time and their efforts. And I thought this was such a good reminder of the power of systems from a business perspective, but also of giving ourselves help (laughs) from a personal perspective. Because I think sometimes we feel like, oh, I can't systemize something or I can't ask for help or I can't hire some support part-time or on contract because if I'm working hard, it means I'm really doing something meaningful and I'm working hard, which means I'm valuable and worthy. And we have all these notions wrapped up in our head that to be successful, we have to work hard. And sometimes it has to feel like work. That's another thing we say, you know, Hmm. and I want to really challenge that. And Mark's comments really prompted this because I think I have that tendency (laughs) to be like, you know, if this isn't challenging, it means I'm not really trying hard enough. And if I'm asking for help or systematizing things. I'm just cheating. I'm making it too easy. And what I just realized was, no, bro, that's how people are happy and successful at the same time. (laughs) It's because they've realized that you don't have to work 18 hours every day to be wealthy in the ways you want to be wealthy, whether that's financially, health-wise, time-wise, any way. Yeah. I mean, because even as you brought up thinking about systems, like my brain started thinking about all the things that I could probably be systematizing. And then it, then I felt like this kind of sense of loss or something. And yeah, it feels like, you know, I've heard this, this spoken before, but it's like running a business or, you know, pursuing any big goal that you have is a spiritual practice because you have to look at your own stuff. Like you have to look at the own, your own things that are blocking you and your own, like, to me, I feel like it comes from like when you say, I have to work really hard. I should feel like work, you know, work isn't supposed to be fun. You know, those things. It's along the same lines of feeling like you need to deserve happiness, like mm-hmm. that you have to earn self-care or that you have to earn fun, you know, <laughs> like, yes. like it's an exchange, you know. <laughs> and we're taught that all the time. Do your homework before you watch TV. Yeah. Eat your veggies before you get dessert. There's a lot of <laughs> programming growing yeah. up from the time we're kids that you have to do something to deserve the thing you really want, which is good. I'm not, I'm saying delayed gratification is an excellent life skill to have, but it's important to recognize when you're doing that in pursuit of a higher goal versus when you're doing it because you feel like you have to suffer to be worthy of actually being happy. Yeah. And sometimes that's going to feel gray, right? It's going to feel like both, you know, that's (laughs) in reality. And that's where it can be really challenging. And I mean, I don't know, I feel really grateful for our mentors that we have, Jesse Corrin and Charlotte Jacobs right now through Thrive Academy, because they have a huge business. You know, they have, they started 15 years ago. Now they have, you know, 29 employees. They're making millions of dollars a year and they're putting a ton of energy into their business, but they're being really conscious about where they're using their energy. So they have like a team of people that come into their home and like assist them in the morning to help get their kids ready and take them out. They have someone that comes in and cleans and and does their cooking because they want to be able to use the energy that they have that's like limited that they're taking self-care and time to to grow and build to like focus that energy on things that only they can create like their relationship with their kids or their relationship with each other or relationships with business people i find that so inspiring because they're really successful and yet also committed to self-care and enjoying their lives and taking care of themselves so that they can then really 
do their jobs well. So like, I, I always keep coming back to them as like our mentors, you know? Yeah. And the irony is I think we often tell ourselves, oh, I don't have the time to put systems in place. When, <laughs> you know, it's so ironic because when you actually put the system in place, it frees up so much more time. And I was guilty of that, but I also recognize it. So for example, for reaching out to principals at schools for my most recent motivational assembly campaign about growth assemblies, I was procrastinating reaching out in the spring of now 2017 because I was just like, oh, I have to put a system into place and it's going to take so much time and it's technology. And and so what I forced myself to do was I said, okay, you're going to manually email every single principal in this one school district because you need to get started. And once I did, I got some great responses. I thought, okay, now what happens if you could actually scale that? So because I spent so many hours manually typing in, you know, principal name, here's their, go find their email and here's the school name and blah, blah, blah. It forced me to say, okay, Blake, there is a better way. (laughs) And now you've seen that it's going to be worth investing in it. And now, you know, for a program that costs $9 a month, I can amplify my outreach by a thousand fold. And so it's so hard sometimes to let ourselves get out of our own way (laughs) and take the easy route. Yeah. And I really, I I like what you were saying earlier about getting support because when we're thinking about systems, like that's a very, you know, entrepreneurial like sort of lens that we're thinking about. But yes, I think when when we're talking about getting support, because I think the one thing about support and this is this is something else that Jesse Corin actually said is that like he's he's reminding us that actually we're supported all the time because we didn't pave the roads that we're driving on or put the plumbing in or you know build the house that we were in necessarily right so like there are all of these systems and communities that were being supported by already by people who, you know, are doing work that they enjoy or doing work that really benefits them and their families. And so when we get support by going to get a massage or something, like you're giving that massage therapist a new client, like you're supporting them and their lifestyle, but you're also supporting you because you're getting some time for yourself to recharge and that sort of thing. And it, I don't know, it's just being more intentional and deliberate and like being willing to say, I deserve this. Mm -hmm. It's like, that is such an important practice because we're being supported already, like being grateful that we're being supported and then feeling like we really deserve it is really beneficial. Yeah. Cause I think often like with the vegetables before dessert metaphor, we feel like we have to earn every ounce of relaxation or self-care or support that we have. And I don't think that's inherently a bad thing if it helps drive us and motivate us to be who we want to be and create what we want to create in the world. But I think often we use it as a whip to punish ourselves all the time and to say, I can't have this thing that would make me happy until I do all these other things. I think we can have both. We can't have both all the time necessarily, but we certainly don't have to have one week of happiness, you know, or two weeks of happiness on vacation a year. I think there are little things that we can do all on the way. And they don't necessarily cost money. I mean, some of it's just like allowing yourself to go take a walk for 30 minutes Mm -hmm. or calling up a friend who you haven't talked to in forever. I mean, I'm guilty of this, you know. I say, oh, I should really call somebody, but that's going to take the time and I really need to get this thing done. But it's like if I don't carve out those 30 minutes, I might go a year without talking to someone I really care about. And I think that's problematic because community supports us just as much as other things support us. Yeah, absolutely. So what insights did you want to share from the conversation with Mark? Well, we talked a little bit with Mark about the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned it actually in the interview with him. If you want to check that out or you've already, you might have already heard it. But I was talking about how he discusses being intentional about what you're feeding your subconscious. And a little caveat here, I definitely would recommend the book. Like I listened to it on on an audio book, but I just want you to know that of course this was really revolutionary and amazing and a lot of 
of philosophies have been built upon this this person's research that he did and the book that he created, but it was written in a long, long time ago. You know, it was written like the 1930s, 19, you know. And so the language can be, I don't know. <laughs> it was a little hard for me to fully um, digest, I would say. Just come out saying it. It was, it was sexist. Yeah, it was, it was sexist. <laughs> it was so sexist. I mean, and it was racist too, right? Like, so let's just be honest. And, it, you know, at the time, like, the people who, who were powerful and the people that he gives examples of were all white men because at the time, that's who was allowed to have power. So, you know... At the time, I'm sure he was like, <laughs> he's bringing in metaphysics and all kinds of stuff, and he had to say lots of caveats. And so it gives you a perspective that, you know, in 2017, when we talk about the concept of think and grow rich and like really being aware of what you're feeding your subconscious, actually being able to manifest because you genuinely are thinking and be- behaving in a certain way feels kind of woo woo and new age or whatever. But that's a lot more normalized in 2017. Imagine what it was like in 1930-something came out, right? But it was still a sensation. And it's so cool because he was talking about being aware of the positive thoughts that come into your mind and the negative thoughts that come into your mind and the things that are like, I can't do this, I can't do this. He was saying, the more you focus on the positive, I mean, not only is it more enjoyable, but essentially you're giving your subconscious you know, cues around gratitude and around like you're just like you're tricking your subconscious into being like, I am already successful. And so then what happens is, is your subconscious mind picks up on things around you based on this, this lens of I am successful, I am powerful. And it gives you ideas and it gives you hints and it gives you, you know, this direction from your subconscious through intuition and other things that moves you further into the direction that you're already wanting to go. So like having the awareness of what you're feeding your subconscious or what your subconscious is used to hearing from you, I mean, that's what's ultimately going to manifest in your life in that way. And I think that that's kind of a trip. (laughs) And I think that's really, I don't know, it's really cool. And so I guess I kind of wanted to just talk about that with you. Yeah, and that's a great reminder that not all support is external, right? Like we can feed ourselves ideas Mm -hmm. and thoughts and patterns and affirmations to support us even when things don't feel like they're going the way we want or the way they're turning out. So I think that's a good point. On a total aside, my father used to use that point, though, to argue that I shouldn't listen to rap music because it would influence my subconscious mind. (laughs) And he was very concerned when he turned on my car one day and Bubba Sparks started yelling (laughs) misogynistic things out that it was somehow turning me into a misogynist. So uh, that's always fun to... Just note the well to that point, you know, this is also something that kind of that Mark kind of touched on, which is that it's thinking combined with action. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Like it's like it's like it's gonna turn you into this robot, or if you're like, I'm successful, you're gonna just turn into this successful person. Like you're feeding that to your subconscious mind and you're acting as if you're acting from the place you want to be. Yeah, that's it. And then those two things combine. And ultimately, over time, you actually manifest the thing that you're wanting to create. Yeah, someone recently said, if you don't take yourself seriously, no one else will. And I think that's absolutely right. It's like, Mm. you have to believe in yourself. Because when you start acting as if, people start treating you as if you are the person you say or the the role you want. And I've seen that with... Even with the motivational speaking work where I wasn't great at the beginning, but I had to muster up enough confidence to at least try to have some opportunities to build confidence, to get better at speaking. And I practiced and I practiced and I self-critiqued and I did a lot of work along it. But you're right. If I hadn't believed in the first place that it was even possible, then I probably wouldn't have gone through all the gigs that weren't perfect to eventually get to the place where I could get really confident and really skilled at it. Yeah. I mean, and because you were coming from that space of, I am a motivational speaker, schools were hiring you, (laughs) which means then you (laughs) had to just do it and like become that. And you you know, you could have just, I guess you just could have quit, but that was where the manifestation happened, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I volunteered for a bunch of years and just did it for free because At the time, I didn't think about myself as a motivational speaker, but that gave me the opportunity to 
learn and develop the skills and have an impact while I was doing it. But to your point, people didn't start paying me for it until I reached a skill level and also a self-image, which I then projected, of someone who is a professional speaker. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that's true for any field or profession. Yeah. I mean, that's what affirmations are. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, affirmations are like reprogramming your brain to see yourself as the person that you want to become. Yeah. And to get into the habit of doing that. I remember when I moved out to California, oh man, I was going through like a really rough time because I was having to pack up all my apartment by myself. And I did get some great support from the community, but I did an estate sale and I had to do all this stuff. And I was also trying to coordinate the finalization of my divorce at the time, which ended up being a mess and it didn't work out. But it was a lot of responsibility, a lot of stress, a lot of change, a lot of pressure. Every single day, I would wake up and just be like, oh my gosh, I have all this stuff to do. I'm so worried. I'm so freaked out. But I would say, if I were somebody that was really brave and really on it, what would I do right now? Like, what would I do today? You know, and in reality, I was really brave and on it, but like, I had to just see that outside of me and like affirm and just act as if, act as if this is a piece of cake and I'm, and I'm just going with the flow. And then by the end of it, like, that's who I had become. But I had to be consciously like, I remember that having to be like, if I, if I am this person, how will I do it? And, you know, sometimes that still helps, you know, like if I'm a runner, what am I going to do today? I'm going to get up and I'm going to go run and I'm going to get it done. And then eventually I'm a runner, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that works for people who are freelancing too. You know, sometimes it can be hard when you're just starting, especially in a creative field, like an artist or a designer or anything to advocate for yourself and believe in yourself in that way. Cause you're like any gig that comes through is like, Oh, I need the money. I need the money. And that can be true. Mm. And there are definitely some allowances that you often have to make at the beginning, but at a certain point you have to make that decision. I am a professional, whatever. I'm a professional artist. I'm a professional speaker. I'm a professional coach. I'm a professional, you know, whatever you are and treat yourself like it and treat your clients like it, and Mm -hmm. they'll respect you more for it. I mean, that's the irony. It's Mm -hmm. like when you respect yourself, it helps other people have boundaries and guidelines on how to respect you. And it'll also weed out people who aren't right for you, clients who aren't right for you. You know, when digital photography started becoming really popular, a lot of photographers who used traditional film were complaining and saying, now everyone thinks that they're a photographer and people aren't hiring photographers anymore. And that was partially true, but the people who were successful were professionals about it and recognized, I need to adapt and change. I need to make it either about the experience or I need to market differently or I need to provide additional value so that people see why hiring a professional photographer still makes sense instead of just giving somebody an iPhone and saying, snap some photos. And I think that's an important reminder because it's both things. We have to treat ourselves like professionals so other people will treat us as professionals. And part of being a professional means being willing to adapt and innovate and iterate as the times change. So how do you think that people have to grow in order to be adaptable like that? Like what kind of mindsets do they need to have? Yeah, that's a great question. I think growth mindset, Carol Dweck's concept that she has popularized is really important because you have to be willing for things not to work and you have to be willing to look at what is sort of working and see, could it be better or does it need to be changed? And that just requires space to be wrong because I think if we feel like it has to only be one way, like if anything in our life only has to be one way for it to be successful, that means all the other ways are failure. If there's only one way that I can get to Sacramento and that's driving in my car and I need to get there in exactly three hours, then if any other scenario happens, I have failed by the standard I've set up for success. Mm. But if I say, okay, the goal is to get to Sacramento within this day, now suddenly I can look at more possibilities. Could I take the train? 
do I have to be the one who drives? Can I carpool with somebody? You know, can I come up the night before so I wouldn't even be so stressed? Like when we narrow our options to only one option that means success or failure, I think we stress ourselves out and often we set ourselves up for disappointment. Can you think of anything like that in your life where there may have been a time when you're like, this is the only way it can work. And then maybe you shifted that perspective and like other things were possible. I paused because that was probably just a lot of life. <laughs> so too many, too many examples. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is where like thinking outside the box and thinking sort of in the gray area and not, not so much black and white has really helped a lot. And I, you know, I, I actually, I had, the, I used to have this saying, I mean, literally I lived my life by better safe than sorry. So I was always looking for the path that or I wouldn't get in trouble or like I wouldn't, like I wouldn't be able to fail. Right. That's the, that's our better safe than sorry. It wasn't like I was timid. Mm -hmm. I was just like, what is the most successful, whatever. And what that did is, yeah, it created one path, one idea, one way, because this is the safest way to where everyone will like me and I will definitely be successful. And, you know, and that's what's going to happen or whatever. And then there leaves no room for any gray area. It's either that or not at all. And that keeps you from doing stuff that's scary because you'd rather be safe. And the only safe path is this. Mm -hmm. So once I finally released that, it's not even just gray area. It's like the rainbow area, you know? It's like all of these amazing, like, multitudes of of, of options are open to you. And some of them are not going to be as safe. Like, some of them are going to be a little more risky. But what it does is it allows you to get to that goal. And it relieves pressure in a way. And you once went on an epic road trip around the country. Would you say that that process of being open to the options and they're not necessarily being one direct destination and only one way. Was that part of that process for you? Yeah, actually, now that I think about it in that way, because I was trying to think like, when did I give up that better safe than sorry? I mean, cause I mean, I explicitly said that to people. This wasn't just like an internal thing. I'm like, listen, my thing is better safe than sorry right now. (laughs) Like, can you imagine? (laughs) But (laughs) yeah, you know, probably because even though I had a sense, you know, I, I started out in Wichita, Kansas and looped, around the West and came back. But I, I had a sense of where I was going to go, but you're right. I, I would stop when I wanted to stop. If I wanted to go see whatever the world's deepest well or whatever, it's in Kansas. <laughs> it's called the big well. Anyway, like if I wanted is, to- Is it worth seeing? I, yeah. I mean, just like any roadside attraction is worth seeing, you know? <laughs> just like any giant hole in the ground is worth seeing. You can go down there and people have like written their names and I don't know, you know, you can be like, oh- Jenny was here <laughs> in 1991. Corey, Jenny Corey and Susan for yeah. life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for real. But, you know, but that's the thing is that it was, you're right. It was like I was opening up. It wasn't just like, I'm getting there. Like, I'm getting there. The best way to get there for sure and safe is just stay on this road. It was just like, well, I'm going to get there and like, I'm going to stop at this restaurant or I'm going to pull over and sleep and eat beans out of a can or whatever I was doing. I was living in my car for like six weeks, you know? And, and yeah, I think it definitely just, it allowed me to see more options. Yeah. Which is interesting. I feel like, I know I've talked several times recently on the podcast about giving up my to-do list, but I feel like giving up my to-do list was a thing (laughs) like that for me where I used to think the only way to be productive was you had to list out all the things you had to do and then you had to rank them in priority order. And if you didn't do this, (laughs) you couldn't be productive. (laughs) Or at least I couldn't. And so giving up my to-do list, it has changed my life because I'm not sitting there thinking there's only one way for me to be maximally productive and I'm not doing it right now. So I've got this one thing that I really need to do, but I either am creatively blocked or I'm procrastinating or I'm avoiding it or I'm afraid of it. And so now I'm not doing it and now I'm sad or frustrated or really procrastinating because, oh my gosh, you can't even do the only thing that's the most important thing that you need to do right now. (laughs) And all that pressure, yeah, I just made myself wrong all the time or not good enough or not productive enough. And since I gave up my to-do list, you know, you have to remind me of things every once in a while. (laughs) But for the most part... Yeah, it's rare. Yeah, yeah, but for the most part, like I'm getting so much more done. I would say I am at least 50% more productive, if not 90% more productive since giving up my to-do list. 
and I'm getting the things done that really matter because those are the things that come into my mind, but I'm not so locked on to the only one thing and only one way to do it that I block myself and tense up. That's amazing. You're inspiring me. to. I mean, you've talked about it so many times and I've been like, eh, I'm still pretty attached to my to-do list, but you're inspiring me right now. Maybe I'll give it a shot. Well, I just say do what works for you. I don't know. I haven't even tried it. Oh, well, maybe go for a week or something. And just see. You can always come back to it if you need to. Well, thank you for a really lively discussion. Thank you. Inspired by Mark Uberti. If you haven't heard the episode, you can check it out. It came out last week. And hopefully you will join us next week for a brand new interview. Thanks so much, Motivational Millennials. For show notes and previous episodes, or to learn more about our coaching and event offerings, visit motivationalmillennial.com. That's millennial, M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L. Keep in touch with us at facebook.com slash motivational millennial. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email with your thoughts, comments, and suggestions at podcast at motivationalmillennial.com. And tell us who you might like to hear from, or if you think you or anyone you know would be good for the show. Our theme music was composed and performed by our very own Blake Brandis. The Motivational Millennial Podcast is edited by Brittany Felix. Have Have a great great week, week, Motivational Motivational Millennials. Millennials!